Yeah, so whatever is the main task at hand, that's what you're supposed to be aware of. Next question. Please ask retreatants to look out for one another. If there's a missing person, if they suspect is missing, please let us know. Two retreatants were lost in the forest this afternoon. Fortunately, Allah, a neighbour drove them back to China Grove. Really? Who was lost in the forest? You, you can't get lost. There's a big fence around here. You walk through the fence. Now this is the reason why we have like precepts and like a fence. <laughs> if you go over that fence and break your precepts. If you do naughty things. How far did you get? Very far. <laughs> How far? Because the, the only other property up there is a prison. And if you walk into there, you'll be stuck there for years. Yeah. Okay, now listen. There's a fence around here, so don't go through. You know what? Why you put a fence there? So you don't go through it. <laughs> so stay within the fence, and you can't get lost. Okay. Oh dearie me. <laughs> Does an arahat ever get angry or become irritated? No. <laughs> Now that's one way you can tell if someone's enlightened or not. If they get irritated or angry, of course they're not enlightened. And you all know that. Okay, it's that story in uh, Happiness Through Meditation about the monk who went onto the island to live alone, to become a fully enlightened monk. He asked his abbot, he said, look, you've got many monks here. Not far away there's an island in the middle of a lake where no one ever goes, perfect for solitude. I'll build a simple hut, and all I ask, all I ask is once a week, get one of the attendants to row across to the island, to leave me supplies for the week, just simple things, rice and a few vegetables, and you can go back afterwards, so I can live in solitude. And the abbot said, okay. So for three years, that monk lived <coughs> in perfect solitude. Just once a week, the attendant would come to make sure he was okay and, and had enough things to eat and any other sort of medicines and stuff he needed. And so after three years, in perfect seclusion, he decided he was enlightened. An arahat perfectly free of all anger and all wants. So he thought, what should I do next? How do you let people know that you're enlightened? So, the next time the attendant came over in the boat, he asked the attendant, can I please have some parchment, a pen and some ink? I want to write some calligraphy. Because in the Chinese tradition, the way that you write those characters is a sign of how advanced you are. And what you say conveys your attainment. So one week later, the parchment, the ink and the quill pen came. And then, as the attendant went away, the monk sat in deep meditation preparing himself to write the words of an enlightened being. When he came out of meditation, he picked up the pen and dipped it in the ink and wrote with exquisite strokes, the diligent monk, alone for three years, is no longer moved by the four worldly winds which in Buddhism means you've cracked it, you're an enlightened person. And he let the parchment dry and he waited, waited for the attendant to come the next week. When the attendant came, he had the scroll neatly rolled up, tied by a little ribbon and said, give this to your abbot. 
and then he relaxed because he imagined once the abbot saw this calligraphy in the message, the claim to enlightenment, he imagined what would happen next. Maybe he'd become an abbot of an important monastery somewhere. Maybe that scroll will be hung up for monks in the future to be inspired by. And the days went by and the attendant came back <coughs> and gave what looked like his old scroll back to him. He wondered, did you give it to the abbot? He said, yes, this is what the abbot gave you back. So with excitement he opened up that scroll. It was his scroll with his calligraphy on it. But on top of the first line, the diligent monk, the abbot had written in red ballpoint pen, fart. <laughs> what? And on the next line, <laughs> it's no longer moved. No, the diligent monk, alone for three years. There was another fart, this time in capital letters. And the next one, uh, diligent monk, alone for three years, it's no longer moved. There was a fart with an exclamation mark on it. And the last line, by the four worldly winds, a big fart, capital letters, exclamation marks and underlined. And that monk was so upset. This was a calligraphy of an arahat, and it's been sport by this, you know that is people who do graffiti all over the world? <laughs> by this stupid, incompetent abbot. He spoiled this. He doesn't know enlightenment when it's in front of his fat nose. He was so upset and he called the attendant, take me back. And so the attendant had to row him back to the monastery and he stormed into the abbot's office. He slammed the parchment on the pa oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> slammed the parchment on the table. He said, look at this, what have you done to my beautiful parchment? And the abbot was calm. And he slowly unrolled the parchment, stood up, and read it out to the monk. The diligent monk, alone for three years, is no longer moved by the four worldly winds. Yet, monk, four little farts <laughs> have blown you clean across the lake. <laughs> There's only little winds. <laughs> And the monk realised, oh God, I'm not enlightened after all. <laughs> <laughs> and went back and meditated some more. And that's a traditional way we try and find out if someone's enlightened. And if you know, someone comes up and says they're fully enlightened, I tell them it's impossible for females to become enlightened. <laughs> they go, what? What do you mean? <laughs> Sorry, you're not enlightened, you failed the test. <laughs> You do anything to try and upset them. And that's, that's the best way you can find out whether they're enlightened or not. See if they get angry. If they don't, it doesn't mean they're enlightened. But if they do get uh, angry, they're certainly not. Venerable Sir, please read the question slowly. <laughs> Your Angmo English is hard to catch by the child. No, man, he, he, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I will read the questions slowly if you write them slowly. <laughs> How can you read something like this slowly? This is so small, you've got enough mud. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, thank you for being so inspiring. Just want to share this. I took a nature walk today and I realized that I'd wandered off too far. <laughs> oh no. I finally spotted Jana Grove to my very, very far right, looking rather small. There was no track leading through the trees and thick bramble. I just went in a general direction, parting and parting ways with many tall brambles without being able to see further ahead but finally did come to a clearing, but still with no view of Jana Grove. I walked in a general direction, I remembered, and lo and behold, I found the Buddha, a lovely statue in a quiet sitting place. That's a secret Buddha garden. 
So, it's not that far, it's within the fence. <laughs> so don't go too far. So I thought to myself, if you are on the right path, you can't really get lost. <laughs> exactly. Now remember, uh, in that book, The Art of Disappearing, have you read that book? In the preface, I told you to get lost, but I didn't mean in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Ajahn Brahm, what is Nama Rupa? What about the five elements, earth, wind, etc.? How is Nama Rupa and the five elements linked to meditation? Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. Nama Rupa is just one way of looking at the objects of consciousness, in particular regarding the five candors which make up the body and the mind. The first candor is the body Rupa, it's called, and then the other four candors are to do with the mind. Things like Vedana, that's you know, the uh, feeling of happiness or, or pain associated with each one of the six senses. And there's perception, there is what we call volitional formations, which includes thought and will. And that's nama. And the consciousness is the fifth. So consciousness and nama rupa. The Buddha said those two lean against each other like two sheaves of reeds, using agricultural simile. So when you've got two sheaves of reeds leading together, that's consciousness and nama rupa. You take one of those away, the other one falls over. So basically, you can't have consciousness without something to be conscious of. And when there's nothing to be conscious of, there's no consciousness. So that's nama rupa and the, um, and the uh, consciousness. And the five elements, it's usually the four elements, we can always add a few other elements onto it, if you like, earth, wind, fire and water. That was just the old way they understood, you know, rupa, you know, body, stuff. But that's past its use by date, the four elements, because now if you've ever done science, they're quarks, they're Higgs bosons, there's all sorts of stuff out there. And Higgs boson, is that earth? fire, water or air, it's none of those. So, so you can use the earth, fire, water and whatever else it is, but you don't really need to these days, just no stuff. Dear Ajahn, I have had a few experiences when I am feeling quite still and very contented with my breath. When I feel, feel teardrops forming at the corner of my eyes, can you please help me understand this? If you feel teardrops, if it's happy, it's supposed to happen. It's a form of pity, joy. So you cry from joy. You could be crying because you're sitting so long and your <laughs> legs hurt like hell. You could be crying because of the old jokes. Oh, not that one again. You could be crying because of the bad chanting. <laughs> Whatever it is. But anyway, if it happens, let it happen. Cry, it's good for you. Dear Ajahn, sometimes when we wake up from our sleep, the mind is awake, but the body is not. I can't feel the body. Is this similar to jhana? <laughs> oh, no, you can't get jhana that easy. <laughs> so, yeah, your body is quiet and relaxed and your mind is waking up, but when it's jhana, it's incredible bliss. The bliss better than sex. So, when you wake up, is that better than sex? <laughs> <laughs> if it is, you're weird. <laughs> so incredible happiness and bliss in, in jhanas. Dear Ajahn, sometimes when I get into deep meditation, very still and blissful, good, I thought I saw the nimittas, but I realized that the stream of light seems to be coming from outside, and I felt my eyes not totally shut. Why is that so? Look, it's very hard for you to see light streaming in from outside, inside this hall. You'd have to be looking up for a start, and the right place, if there's any sun coming up here. So if it's in this hall, that was a nimitta, nothing else. I noticed some tradition taught meditation with your eyes open looking downward. What's your view on that? Wouldn't it be more difficult to focus on the breath? Exactly. 
So the whole idea is allowing the, the um, five senses to disappear. And the easiest way is to close your eyes. I mentioned yesterday or the day before about in Zen retreats, you look at the wall with your eyes open, but still that's another way, but it's not as good as closing your eyes. In some tradition they ask you to keep your eyes open just so you don't fall asleep. But you still fall asleep anyway, so <laughs> it's a waste of time. So please close your eyes. In most traditions, they always have the eyes closed. Someone's drawn a little cartoon. Oh, actually, it's on the other side. They just traced it. Oh. I thought I progressed in my meditation today because for the first time I couldn't feel my hands. But why is it that I could still feel my legs? It's just that my hands were numb. <laughs> You're getting there. Start with your hands, then you get your legs. And then eventually you get your mouth and you don't talk anymore. <laughs> so it's starting, very good. When, while meditating it felt like the room was lighted as if someone lit up the room. It was for a very moment and then the light faded quickly. It happened twice in the last three days. What could that be? Or maybe someone has really switched on the lights. Very unlikely. Now these are the first uh, bits of nimitta comes up. Remember, it's like, like a sheet of light, everything is bright. But then eventually it focuses on just one nice bright spot. But that's good, it's working, that's what's supposed to happen. It's like your, your eyes are closed and you, know, you shouldn't know, you can, if you want to open one eye and it's totally dark. Or as Claire does, I go for the Singapore Airlines um, uh, eye shades. And if you have any doubts, put those eye shades on and then you'll know for absolute certainty that this is not light from outside, it has to be a nimitta. I've got a few more of those if anyone needs them. Dear Ajahn, after three days I still, not, I still cannot sit still. What should I do? Go home. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't go home. This Danny is not here, but what we can, if you can't sit still, we'll get some string and tie you up. <laughs> to the chair, so you've got no choice. <laughs> still. Don't try to sit <coughs> still. You can sit still when you're not trying, when it just happens naturally. When you're watching a movie, can you sit still? So why can't you sit still when you're meditating? So what you can do is, all these different types of meditation, what's happening is your thought is usually driving you to be restless. So just be, make peace, be kind, be gentle, follow all the advice of don't try and fight this, but say welcome restlessness, like the monster who came into the Empress Palace. And little by li little over the next couple of days, you'll find you'll calm down and you'll be able to sit still for longer and longer and longer. Now you don't need to sit still all day, but just maybe half an hour a day, or you know, a couple of half hour sessions. Don't push it too much, and gradually get into stillness. Dear Ajahn, body scan meditation. Can I request a favour from you to guide us through a body scan meditation, please? Thank you. Sometimes people ask for guided meditations, but it's very difficult to do in this context when you've got interviews and other stuff going on, because in the mornings we, you know, we have our chanting <coughs> and other stuff and some people like to sit quietly. So if you want to do a body scan meditation, a guided one, I'm sure that somebody's got sort of uh, a, an iPhone, you can put a sort of an ear adapter in and get it downloaded so you can hear it yourself. It's okay to sit here just listening to a guided meditation through an ear, earphone. So that's the best way of doing it. If you haven't got <coughs> A, um, a recording of the body scan meditation. I'm sure that Daniel can get one for you. Sorry? On YouTube. On YouTube, yeah. So you can sort of download that. I know you've all got your gizmos here and get sort of a, a little um, earphone so you can plug it in there and have your own. Dear Ajahn, I am not sure whether I have intestinal problems or maybe it is the amount of cheese that I'm eating. <laughs> But for the last couple of days, I've been farting a lot. <laughs> if you're farting a lot, please sit at the back. 
so there's no one behind you. <laughs> it's fine when I'm alone in my cottage, I just let it go. However, the problem arises when I'm meditating in the hall. Do I just let it go and fart away, or do I have to suck it back in? Does the same etiquette apply to farting as coffee? Thank you. Get a plug. <laughs> now it's natural that people pass wind. So just, they can sit in the back there somewhere, so that you know, there's no one right behind you. And that way I'll find out who the ones are. <laughs> Shirley! <laughs> no, it's just part of nature. So, a lot of time people don't notice after a couple of seconds, it's just part of life. It's a greater letting go, the letting go of self, is underlying all our grasping at love, happiness, success, pleasure, etc., the grasping of a self. Yeah, but who grasps the self? So sometimes it's very hard to let go of the self. It's like eating your own head. How can you eat your own head? That was a simile from uh, Charles Dickens and Oliver Twist. You know, to eat your own head is impossible to do. The same way of letting go of yourself is impossible to do because you do it. So what happens is your idea of self fades away. You don't let it go, you don't do anything. Because all doing creates more self. These are some deeper teachings here that if you strive in meditation, you are actually reinforcing and strengthening your idea of self. That's where the sense of self comes from. All your achievements, all your trying, all the great things you've done, that makes who you are. Which is why when we struggle and strive and try to make things happen, we are going against the stream of Dhamma. We're making a bigger self. But when you let go, when you just make peace, be kind, be gentle, and not even trying to attain things, just being here, if jhana comes, it comes, if it doesn't, it's all, all the same to me. I'm just sitting under the mango tree, perfectly still. If that's how you meditate, your sense of self gets less and less and less. You vanish. That was the whole reason we wrote the book, Art of Letting Go, or The Art of Disappearing, sorry. Just basically you disappear. That's how you let go of self. It disappears, it vanishes. And any of you who know the Pali, sometimes the, the translations which people have done need to be adjusted to see the full picture they have this word which you might read many times, viraga. It's a whole thing. <coughs> you get insight, you see things as they truly are. From stillness you see things as they truly are. Then you get this dispassion and then viraga. Things fade away. And then nib niroda, they cease. And sometimes the word viraga is sometimes called dispassion, but it has another meaning fading away, which is the right meaning because it's the way that you fade, you disappear. In the same way that you experience your hands disappearing, they just fade away. Not there's one point and suddenly they're gone, they just, they fade, it's a process. They're not there anymore. And in deep meditation, you fade away. You're not there anymore. And that's how you realize non-self. You don't let it go, you don't put it down. You're just holding it and just, it's gone. It disappears. That's why stillness is so important. Stillness is the cause for things vanishing. So you're still, you don't do anything. And you vanish. It was. I saw this when I was a student in Cambridge in about 1970. This was English graffiti in Cambridge University. When they had graffiti in those days, it was actually meant something, and it was usually very wise. And this I saw with my own eyes on the wall of the philosophy department in Cambridge. 
The first line was <coughs> uh, to do is to be. René Descartes, the French philosopher, who said, I think therefore I am. He also refined that to do is to be. And underneath that was written, to be is to do. That was Jean-Paul Sartre, the French existential philosopher. That's what being was. So the first one is, to do is to be, by um, René Descartes. The second one was turning it around, to be is to do, by Jean-Paul Sartre. And that was summed up so brilliantly by the modern American philosopher. Dooby dooby do, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> that was so brilliant. <laughs> but the first part of that was actually showing that your existence, who you think you are, is so caught up with what you do. You know, you're a doctor. You say, that's who I am. That's not who you are, that's just what you do. But you see, that's who we think we are. I'm a monk, because you know, I monk around. <laughs> that's what I do. So you can actually see that when you do things, that's who you are. So what happens when you don't do anything? When you're still? You actually vanish. Your identity disappears. Which is one of the reasons why it's a really tough thing to do nothing. It's like you're vanishing, like you don't exist anymore. You're disappearing, but that's what's supposed to happen. It's difficult, but it's great fun, because it's so happy when you're not around. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, I noticed a constriction in my throat during meditation at times. Perhaps it's some sort of energy blockage. Is such a phenomenon normally indicative of anything in particular? Just probably got a sore throat, like many people have. Take a lozenge. <laughs> now it's nothing meditative if you've got a constriction in your throat. There's a lot of, this is pollen season now in this part of uh, the world, so there's a lot of hay fever. So it may be, and sometimes people don't have hay fever anywhere else in the world, but they, they get it when they come here. So be careful, it may be just an irritation in the respiratory system. And just take some hot water, just relax, rest, it usually goes away. But it's nothing to do with meditation. Dear Ajahn, when the breath is more refined, the body may need to swallow saliva. How to prevent it? Thank you, Ajahn. But just swallow and don't make a big problem of it. Because sometimes you think, should I swallow, should I not swallow? <laughs> then it just goes on forever. And now, can you feel your saliva now? I can feel mine. As soon as you're ta talking about it, then it becomes a problem. Do you have problems? Do you wake up in the middle of the night when you swallow saliva? No, you just swallow it. It's an automatic process. It doesn't bother anybody. So the point is, just don't make it a big problem, and it's natural, and it won't disturb your meditation at all. If that doesn't work, we can send Dani in to get one of these things from the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> which will suck the saliva out, so you can meditate without any problems at all. So if you're really having trouble, we'll get one of those for you. <laughs> Next question. The Buddha taught that we let go of our senses. Does that mean persons who are hearing impaired, visually impaired or mute have a higher chance of gaining enlightenment or even faster? going into jhanas? That's actually a really, really good question. It's, as many people know, say if you are blind, you know, you're visually impaired, your other senses become incredibly refined. So when one sense has gone, uh, that part of the brain is taken up with the other senses. So, yeah, maybe you have no problem with seeing things, but you can hear, you're so incredibly sensitive. Or, you know, if you're, if you're deaf, sometimes your hands are just so sensitive, you can actually feel everything with your body. So basically, there's no advantage or disadvantage, you know, if there's, uh, one of your senses is impaired. So you don't gain anything, you don't lose anything. So it's all the same, no matter if you've only got four senses. 
Many of the tree trunks in the bush along the walk to Bodhinyana monasteries are blackened. When did the bush fire pass through? Oh, actually, this time last year it was very dry. And there was an arsonist in the area who was just going around lighting fires. About 13 or 14 in this area, never caught. So we don't know exactly who it was. But <coughs> they're only small fires, so they didn't do too much damage. And it's, uh, in a sense, it actually helps the bush here because if you did a little bush fire burn this time last year, it means there's not so much fuel load, so it's safer. So we didn't really mind that so much. But it's part of living in the Australian forest. So sometimes things burn. So this time of the year, because it's a very wet year, and you've seen some of the rain the first few days, it's really, really safe right now. I seem to have an internal timekeeper. In meditation I seem to always be prompted to end it at 30 minutes. Why is this and how can I deal with it? It's true, you do have internal clocks and that's why that uh, you can actually say to yourself, I will meditate for one hour and if you really listen to what you say and mean it, that's how long you meditate for. For those who never tried this before, I invite you to try this tonight I don't know what time you, you want to wake up tomorrow morning, probably 5 to 7. Oh no, no, 6.40, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but say you want to wake up at 6.40 you know, for breakfast. You can set your alarm to 6.45, just to make uh, you feel um, safe and not afraid. And then when you go to sleep, just tell yourself, I will wake up at 6.40. I will wake up at 6.40, I will wake up at 6.40. Just say that to yourself three times, clearly, and listen with as much mindfulness as you can. And you set your alarm to 6.45 just in case. And you'll find you wake up in the morning, you don't know what time it is, the alarm hasn't gone off, and you look at your clock and it'll be one or two minutes either side of 6.40. It's amazing just how your body clock can wake you up when you tell it to. And of course, you know, if you want to get the morning chanting for a change, you say, <coughs> I will wake up at quarter to six, I'll wake up at quarter to six, I'll wake up at quarter to six to get ready for the chanting at six. And you'd be surprised, just, you'll just wake up without an alarm. So please try that because it just shows us how this body clock works. And all you need to do is to make the suggestion, listen to it, and it works. So for those of you doing this person 30 minutes and that's all you can do. Program your body clock. This is just a habit, that's all you have. It's just tell yourself when you sit down, you close your eyes, you get yourself reasonably relaxed and you tell yourself, I will meditate for 40 minutes. I will meditate for 40 minutes. I will meditate for 40 minutes. Tell that to yourself. And usually you'll find out you go for 40 minutes. That's how you can condition your mind. You mentioned that thoughts coming up is discontent and unhappiness. In meditation today I thought of friends and I was happy and grateful. What does that mean? Yeah, you can think of sex, you can think of your favourite movie and that will make you happy as well. So you don't have no any other thoughts. But that's not learning how to be still. So if you think of your friends and happy and grateful, or you might think of, well, actually you might think of your favourite food. It makes you happy at first, but very disappointed later. <laughs> so there's all sorts of ways of borrowing happiness. And this is really what we're doing. This is what the Buddha said, that the sensory desire is just a borrowing happiness. And you have to pay it back with interest afterwards. So any fantasy or stuff, yes, it stops you being sleepy, but you know, you have to pay that back later on. So it's much better to try and be quiet. Yes, you can think and be happy, but it's only borrowing happiness. So if you can be still, and happy to be still, then that's the true happiness of the mind. When the breath is more refined, how to program the knower stronger than the doer? When the breath is more refined, just let the breath be. 
So when the breath is very refined, it's very, very soft, hopefully it will start to be a happy, beautiful breath. This is the usual way it occurs. The breath calms down and because you're not doing very much, <coughs> the energy in your mind goes into knowing it's not wasted on doing. So the knowing, the mindfulness gets stronger, it gets empowered, it gets brilliant. And with that comes a natural form of happiness. Have you ever been depressed? If you're depressed, nothing tastes nice. Doesn't matter how much effort the cook puts into your lunch. Ugh, it doesn't taste nice. And uh, the sun, ugh, it's just too hot. The rain is too wet. The Ajahn Brahm talks, the same old jokes. I'm fed up. The meditation cushion is too lumpy. <laughs> the beds are just too cold or whatever. When you're depressed, you can't enjoy anything. And the whole world is grey for you. But, it just means you've got low energy. But when you, speak <coughs> you build up energy in the mind, everything is delicious and beautiful. The rain is brilliant. The cold, oh, it's so wonderful. It's just so embracing and invigorating, the cold. Ajahn Brahm's jokes, oh, the golden oldies. I remember the first time I heard that. <laughs> And oh, that was just such beautiful memories. And everything is wonderful when you've got lots of energy in the mind. So this is what usually happens when the knower becomes strong. It's just too happy, which means you just can't do anything. You just, <coughs> remember when you listen to great music or you listen to your movie, you don't do anything because you're satisfied with happiness. It is the happiness stops the doing and stops the thinking. So please cultivate the happiness in meditation and don't be depressed. That's why one of the greatest ways of overcoming depression is meditation. Why? Why does that work? Because you're being still and peaceful. It means the energy is allowed to flow to where it really belongs, in the mind. You wake up, and everything is bright and brilliant again. Dear Ajahn, is it craving if we respectfully request for hot Asian lunch? <laughs> <coughs> These are Asian <coughs> lunches, Caucasian lunches. <laughs> you don't know what it was like to be when my nine years I was a monk in Thailand. I never saw any Western food, never a slice of bread, never a chip, nothing. All I ever saw was Asian food. <laughs> and you know what happened? It was actually after seven years. After seven years, I went to England to visit my family. And my mother said, oh, you've been in Thailand, I'll make you rice and curry. <laughs> oh, no. I'd had that so many years. And this is absolutely true. When I went to UK after seven years as a monk, only once did I get chips. And that was from a Thai man. <laughs> All the other people thought, oh, you know, you like, must like rice and curry, you've lived there for so long. And I was just dreaming of... <laughs> so, remember, it's just four elements, that's all you're eating. <laughs> but we are actually trying. I did hear that some of you were wanting some Asian. And actually the cook is supposed to be from Singapore. And I don't know why she's not making Singapore food. It must mean because you ha your karma is not ripe yet. <laughs> But at least you're getting a breakfast, some congee every day. Is, is there enough of that? Very good. <laughs> but it will come, you get an Asian lunch soon. But you can understand how I felt. But it is true because, you know, sometimes that you get used to a certain type of food. 
But what about poor Priya? You know, she's Sri Lankan. She doesn't get anything. It's either English food or Caucasian food or Asian food, but not Sri Lankan food. Poor Priya. <laughs> but anyway, the, we're trying our very best. We're trying to get some Asian food soon. Meditation is good and we all know it, but how do we keep the practice sustainable after we leave this wonderful place and return to the real world? You haven't left yet. <laughs> it's another week before you leave. Stop being so far ahead of yourself. <laughs> you can ask that question on the last hour. Last day. Thank you for your utmost patience and gentleness with us. Could you please advise us how to develop the uh, genuine or the something beautiful breath when it appears? You just let it be. Uh, on the back of t-shirts, once it gets warm and people don't cover themselves up with all sorts of blankets and stuff, you will see the words, make peace, be kind, be gentle. That's all you ever need to do at any stage of the meditation. Just make peace with the delightful breath or whatever else you, you, you're experiencing. Because if you make peace with it rather than changing it, you're making peace, which means peace is growing. You get more peace and more peace and more peace. And the meditations are just peace upon peace upon peace. Many moments of making peace and then you have the house of peace. Just like this hall, many, many bricks all laid one by one by the builders. <coughs> And now we have a hall of bricks, just like you have the house of peace, by laying one brick of peace after the other. That's how we make it. So just make peace with whatever you experience. Be kind. <coughs> Open the door of your heart to the delightful breath. This is good enough. What more do you want? Some people haven't even been able to watch the present moment. So just you're doing well, enjoy, and just be so gentle. I'm just going to go very, very slowly. This is good enough for me. So the opposite of gentleness is being violent. Come on, get on to the next stage, stop messing around. So please don't do that, just always make peace, be kind, be gentle. And that's advice for any stage of meditation, and it works. A lay person, while on her way to give food dana to an arahat, she saw a hunger-stricken and dying beggar. Who should she give the food to, the beggar or the arahat? Who would you give it to? Put your hand up. Who's for the beggar? Okay, who's for the arahat? Oh, poor arahats. <laughs> <laughs> because how do you know it's the arahat? That beggar could be the arahat. Who knows? So what the Buddha said is, give where your heart finds the greatest satisfaction. So a lot of you, it doesn't matter about the arahat, if you give where your heart finds satisfaction, you know, because someone really needs it, that's a wonderful place to give. You get much more joy out of that. And sometimes you give to all these people. And sometimes, I, I, I give that answer to, I'd give to the beggar, because I had that experience myself when I was in Thailand. <laughs> that we used to eat this terrible, terrible food. You know, it, Asian food would, be, would have been nice. <laughs> it wasn't Asian food, it was just you know, rice and frogs or, or beetles. No, egg curry, no, it's ant egg curry, red ant curry as well, we had red ant curry, and anything was slithered on the ground, we ate, <laughs> literally. <coughs> and so one day, having eaten this disgusting food, I was sitting in Ajahn Chah's monastery, there was about 50 monks there, waiting for our, our daily meal of rice and rotten fish. And that was it, disgusting stuff. I don't know how, actually, how I ate that in those days. But anyway, that's all you had, so you ate it. And a car came. And it was one of these pickup trucks with a tray in the back, 
full of pots of food. It had come from the city, which meant this was a nice, was nice Asian food, <laughs> stuff you could eat. And the man got out of the car, came into the, the dining hall, and just asked, is Ajahn Chah here? He was actually out that day. He went to do a blessing at someone's house. So I said, no, he's not here. So the man got back in his car and drove away. <laughs> that, I will never forget that, forever. You could see the food, you could smell the food, but it was driving away. And instead we had rice and rotten fish again. <laughs> but why did he do that? Because he thought, give it to an arahat is where you get all of the good merit and give it to beggars like me. <laughs> That's how I felt. <coughs> was no merit. Of course, you give it to the person who needs it. That's what I would do. Hope this is not a stupid question. There is no such thing as a stupid question. Sometimes if a person asks a question and it is wrongly put, you may feel stupid for a second. But if you don't ask the question, you are stupid for the rest of your life. Remember that. People say that if you meditate, it is inevitable that you are able to, to see spirits, whether you want to or not. Is it true? Unfortunately, it's not true. Many people meditate and they can't see any spirits at all. Venerable Sariputta was one of those. Fully enlightened, very wise, but he could not see any spirits. But if you do see spirits, you're very lucky. Spirits are very, very helpful. They know lottery numbers. <laughs> they know the stock market. They can help you when you know, somebody when there's going to be a car crash, you can avoid the place. Oh, they're really, really helpful. So don't be scared. <laughs> That's why the, you know, the story of the tsunami ghost, which... That's a long time since I told that story. But this was um, just after the Boxing Day tsunami. Uh, this was a... Thai girl married to an Englishman, an Ang Mo, in the town of, where was it, Grabi, which was you know, just maybe 100 kilometers outside of Phuket. And she woke up in the middle of the night after a dream, where she dreamt of seeing this Caucasian girl with long blonde hair, but her clothes all ripped, gashed and bleeding. And the Caucasian girl came to her in the dream and said, I'm dead. I'm dead. Help me. I'm dead. Do I sound like a ghost? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go and turn off the lights, come on. <laughs> there you go. I'm dead, <laughs> help me. And she said, I was on Pee Pee Island when the big wave hit. I'm dead. My cell phone is at the bottom of the ocean. My mother is trying to call me right now. Help me, please. My body is now in the temple in Phuket where they were keeping many of the dead bodies. This is my name. This is the temple. Help me. I want a Buddhist funeral. Cremate me. But don't let my mother know or come. So don't let my mother come until after the cremation. I don't want my mother to see me like this. And tell my mother, here is the number. And after giving a telephone number was when the Thai girl woke up 
And it was one of those dreams which was so clear, she remembered everything. She woke up her husband, told him everything, and her husband was quite shocked that that number was a London telephone number. So he told his wife, give the number a call. She said, no way, you call. So he had to call that number. Someone is in the middle of the night in Thailand, no, late in the evening in, in London. A woman picked up that phone. It was the mother. She had a daughter, that name. And the mother said, I knew that she was dead. She could feel it and she heard the news about the, the big tsunami. She knew her daughter was on PP Island. She said, I knew, but thank you for telling me. Go ahead. And so the next day they drove to Phuket, found the temple which the ghost had named, went inside and saw the body exactly as she had seen in the dream. And because the Thai authorities were trying to get rid of the bodies as soon as possible, they gave permission to cremate that body. They cremated it and the next day the mother arrived from Heathrow to pick up the ashes thanking them for what they had done. And then they went back to Grabi. And a couple of nights later, she had another dream. The English girl came to see her again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Look at me. And she was just so perfectly dressed and groomed. I think the Thai girl said, just like she'd been to like a salon and got her hair done. Her skin was just radiant like she'd been to a spa. And she's wearing this beautiful white dress. Thank you so much for what you have done. She said, I want to help you back. And she gave, or the ghost gave the girl, or maybe Deva, more like a Deva now. The Deva gave the Thai girl another set of numbers, which were not telephone numbers. <laughs> it were lottery numbers. She remembered them and wrote them down when she woke up, and she put a lot of money on that lottery number, and it won, and they made a fortune which is why if ever you see spirits, you should never run away. <laughs> Not until you've asked them for numbers first. <laughs> That's a true story. So that sometimes you should not be afraid of the ghosts, they can help out. So a cow can have a go, <coughs> turn on the light so I can see the next question. <laughs> oh, it's upside down, that's why I can't read it. Wow! Why do ghosts always come in the dark? <laughs> and the answer is they don't. Even in the middle of the day, ghosts come out. The thing is, in the middle of the day, you don't notice them. You think it's just an ordinary person sitting next to you. <laughs> Today, two people disappeared into the forest. <laughs> are we sure the ones who came back are real? <laughs> did, <laughs> did I ever tell you, but sometimes ghosts, you can't tell them apart. One of the most amazing ghost stories in Australia, you don't need to turn the lights off, <laughs> was the, the, the lady who married a ghost. It's a true story, well documented. I can turn the lights off again. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, be kind. So this um, a woman was about to get married, and in the, uh, the Western tradition, that's in a big church, and a girl you wears white, and the, the groom is there waiting in the church for her. But if the wedding, doesn't matter what time the wedding is, the bride must always arrive late. It's tradition. You know, it just shows she's not so keen. You know, just, you know, otherwise the husband will take advantage of you. So even the wedding I did the other day, it was supposed to be at, 
at 3.15 and she didn't arrive till about 3.30, so it made me late. But the bride arrived late, five minutes late, to find that the groom hadn't arrived yet. And she was really disappointed and also a bit concerned. Because sometimes, you know, boys, they get cold feet at the last moment. They don't want to get married. And so, you know, all, you know sometimes the, you know, their friends tell them all these bad jokes about marriage, like I told the other day. But did I tell the joke about love is blind? Yes. I did that one. Okay, what other jokes are there about the man who said, I, I always wanted to marry Mrs. Wright. And I finally found her. That's why I married the right woman. She's always right, and I'm always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> There's loads and loads of marriage jokes. <laughs> but, so sometimes the guys get cold feet at the last moment. So she thought she was going to be stood up. The guy wasn't going to turn up, and as the minutes passed by, she was more and more worried. And there was a sense of relief, but also concern, when she saw the groom, the guy she was about to marry, running down the street towards her. And because she was pleased to see him, but worried because he was bleeding, and his you know, suit was uh, cut. And he told her the reason he was late, he was caught in a car accident. And she took one look at him and said, I'm taking him to hospital. He said, no, no, I'm okay. I want to go through this marriage. It's really important to me. I want to marry you. And she says, I feel okay. So she trusted him. He went into the men's room, cleaned himself up. And even though they started late, they went through the marriage. You know, exchanging rings, making their vows, signing the register, kissing, you know, the whole lot. And after doing all the signing, the kissing, exchanging rings, the bride and groom went in the car to the reception, the party they have afterwards. And as they wanted to have some time together, so they went in the car alone. And she drove because he was still a bit shaky. And everyone else followed after them on the way to the reception hall. The people following found the car parked with the bride sobbing hysterical, and no sign of the groom, the new husband. When they calmed her down, they asked, where's he gone? And she said, I was driving the car, he was sitting next to me, and suddenly he just disappeared. From the, from the passenger seat, he just vanished. They checked afterwards, that spot where he vanished was the spot where he had died an hour or two earlier in a fatal car crash. He died there. And he wanted to get married so much that he made himself as a ghost. He went to the marriage and she didn't know. Even when she kissed him, it was like kissing a real guy. He signed the register, everything. So be careful. <laughs> the next time you kiss someone, <laughs> It could be ghost. <laughs> so they don't just come out at night, sometimes you can marry one. <laughs> so she's Mrs. Ghost now. <laughs> that's a true story, it happened in Australia. It's weird, but that's a true ghost story. And it's because of his craving and desire to go through the marriage that created the solid body for him enough to go through the ceremony but only that much. <coughs> Great story, isn't it? <laughs> Too much, I believe I got better at being at present moment awareness, although I'm still interrupted by thoughts and inner chatter. I almost do not respond to them at all. However, when I come out of meditation, the present moments are not very vivid in my memory. Is that normal? That's quite normal. So. Later on, the present moments, because you're not really holding on to them, you're not making them so important, they don't really stay. What stays in your memory are very strong moments, trauma moments of pain, of disappointment, those are the things which stay in your memory, or very high bliss states. They're the things you remember because they're intense experiences. 
Dear Ajahn, would you please share with us what was Ajahn Tah's teachings which was misquoted? Uh, no, I know what was one of them. I know about like jhanas, because I think it was in uh, Jack Cornfield's book. I remember once he asked him about, you know, is jhana important? And he actually wrote in his book, you know, the questions. Ajahn Chah said, no, not really. And Ajahn Chah was always into jhanas. In some of the earliest talks he gave, he was always encouraging people to do that. So I know that was one quote which was misquoted. But uh, I forget what that book was, which was badly translated. And when we asked the translator, he said, why did you translate it like this? And he's actually said, said, because that's what I think Ajahn Chah really wanted to say. So you have to be very careful. Whenever you're translating a book, you know, you have to know the person, first of all, you're translating. So, you know, you know exactly what they mean when they say things. That's why that, you know, even if you translate what I say, you have to be someone who's gone to retreat, someone who's lived with me. So actually you know exactly what I mean, because you've heard me say the story so many times. Because otherwise, you know, you're not really translating at all. You're actually saying, you know, you're interpreting what you think the person meant. To question two, this is a modern world. Would I be doing others keen to tell? I would I be doing others keen to, to do full-time injustice if I were ordained just for a short period? I'm a female, just for one to two years. It's why just do one to two years of ordination? If you can get enlightened in one to two years, fine. It's like saying, I'm just going to go to university for three weeks. Would a university let you in? And would you really learn very much just going to university for three weeks? Now you've got to go and do the whole course. And why not? It's good being a nun. Although, you know, that's why we're doing a lot of work trying to raise funds for the nuns' monastery, because even the Buddha said that nuns come by things with difficulty. You know, just look in Asia, monks get lots of things. Women get very little. And you know why? Next time we chant the Metta Sutta, listen to it. Whatever living beings they may be, omitting nuns. <laughs> let, <laughs> let none deceive another. <laughs> let none, through anger or ill will, wish harm upon another. <laughs> That's, why. <laughs> That's why. Anyway, question three. Since getting a visa is difficult and Dhamma has a long waiting list, is there other monastery I may apply for practice? What is your recommendation? Thank you very much. Still at the moment for women, it's very difficult. But we, and we've, we've got another monastery, nuns monastery, Santi in Sydney, which we're repopulating again now. That went through a bit of difficulty. We really tried to establish that as a bhikkhuni monastery. So that the few nuns have already gone back there now. But they had a nice nuns monastery in uh, United States, but they didn't get much support at all. And actually the buildings got so badly infected with mold, the health department told them to leave. So they spent the last range retreat all over the place. They had to break the rains. And there's so many wealthy people in California who are supposed to be Buddhist. And they don't help the nuns at all. So it's really weird in the United States. So it's tough. That's why we're working hard to get places for nuns to, to, to live. And Australia is a great place. You know, we've got the land, it's pretty easy to get. And you know, we've got a good country here, so it's close to Asia. So you know, eventually you'll be able to come here. Or maybe when you go, now you're all so kind, you always give donations, and you brought lots of books with you when you came here. So please take some land back with you. We've got lots of land here, so take, <laughs> take a quarter acre back each, and then we could have a nuns monastery in Singapore. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great? 
Dear, next question. Ups and downs of life, challenges, meditate, positive thinking to move on. How to end suffering? Should we still have children and let them suffer? It's a good question. Should you have children? Is that the appropriate thing to do in today's world? You've got climate change, you've got wars. Is it good to have children and let them suffer? You can look upon it in one way. So there's enough people in this world, but look at it in another way. And so you're giving the opportunity of a human birth to somebody so they can actually get close to the Dhamma and actually maybe even uh, become a great monk or a great nun and even uh, help spread the teachings. <coughs> so you can look at it both ways. Sometimes it's good to have a child because you're giving the opportunity of a human life to somebody. You look at it another way, there's already enough children in the world. So, you know, whichever way you want to do. It's, it's, you can't really make a decision there. Dear Ajahn, what is the significance of the katina to the lay person? It is usually, traditionally, it was a way of showing gratitude to the monks who spent the whole range retreat there and also because they've been meditating really hard or really deeply for three months, there was more chance of getting arahats, once returners, non-returners, and a sangha who just finished the range retreat. So there's more chance of getting the biggest bang for your bucks <laughs> when you give stuff. So that's where it usually came from. But these days it's just an opportunity, it's mostly a fundraiser to actually get the building stuff for the, for the next year. So most of the buildings we get you know, come from the, uh, the Katina ceremony. So all the stuff which we're doing over the next year, that's one of the biggest fundraisers at the Katina. That's why we, we have a lot of people come here. They give a lot of donations and that's where we build the stuff for the next year. And that's also why, because you, know, you guys are always so generous, I want you to go and see where we spend the money. Because you know sometimes, you know, you give, you know, you give like the Ang Pao's and donations, but you don't know where it goes. Does it go in Ajahn Brahm's slush fund? <laughs> Does it go to buy him Rolex watches? Does he live in a, in a penthouse? Which is why that on Saturday afternoon, after lunch, you're all welcome to go and see where I live. And you are quite free to rummage around and see if you can find where I keep my Rolex watches. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hiding from you because I know you're being there. And then where I live is where I live. And the only Garrickers, you know, they've been in there many times, they see how I live and what I do. So it's not secret. And you can actually go and see the other monks' huts as well. And that actually gives you inspiration because we don't spend much money on ourselves. A lot of the time any money goes in these other things like the nuns, monastery, halls, meditation centres like this, that's where it all goes. So that you can get some confidence that you know it's hard to make money, you work really hard. And you know these monks come along and say can you sort of help out with this project and that project. And it's really tough sometimes. You know, I was sending uh, Lai Peng and she put this story on the, the website. Sometimes, uh, that's, I think, did I tell that story about, you know, squeezing the lemon here? Yeah, yeah, the lemon challenge. Yeah, the lemon challenge. That's why, I think I told it in Singapore but in a different context. That's like, <coughs> like um, in a bar <coughs> in Singapore. The barman was a very tough guy, he was an ex-weightlifter you know, representing Singapore at Olympic Games, really, really strong. And you know, he retired and got a bar selling alcohol. And he had a challenge in his bar. If anybody, after he squeezed a lemon into a cocktail, if anyone could take that lemon and squeeze another three drops out, they would get, you know, a free drink or like a hundred dollars. And many people tried. You know, these really big, strong guys, they tried to actually to squeeze another three drops out of that lemon. They could not do it at all. And then one day this, this small Singapore girl, really thin, came in and she said, I want to try the lemon challenge. 
And they laughed at her. You're just such a thin, you know, petite, feminine girl. You can't squeeze any more drops out of this lemon. She said, give me a try. And she took that lemon, squeezed not just three drops, seven drops came out of that lemon. And everyone was so amazed, they gave her the prize and said, who are you? She said, I work for Ajahn Brahm on his fundraising. <laughs> We squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. <laughs> I think that's Angie. <laughs> Angie, okay. <laughs> the last time I told that story, I said it was the tax inspectors from Singapore <laughs> squeezing extra out of you people. <laughs> but no, so I'm always really reticent to do that, but. If it's for a good cause, it's worth doing. And I want you to see the causes. And also, you get great joy out of this. So many of you here actually were the donors for this place. And many of you came up to me and said, oh, you're so generous and kind, building this beautiful place for us. A nice hall, and you got your own en-suites, and a beautiful surroundings. Thank you so much. Don't thank me. Thank many of the people from Singapore, Malaysia, Australia as well, and other parts of the world who made this place happen. Thank yourselves. Well done. And it's not just you who enjoy this place. Hundreds of people come here every year, thousands of people. So well done. So when actually you see what you contribute, it gives you so much happiness. That you know, that your five dollars here, ten dollars there, it really works. Yes. And when you actually spend things on a good cause and you see its results, that really, really makes you happy. So that's really important. Last one, no, last two. Meditate for all the goodness to lead a happier life and well being. How do monks spend long duration alone? It's really easy, I'm never alone. When I spent six months in solitude. I never saw another living being for six months. I never spoke to a human being for six months. But I wasn't alone. I was with me. <laughs> <laughs> I was with me all the time. And I never felt lonely because I'm my best friend. So when you're by yourself, if you like yourself, if you've got a good relationship with yourself, you'll never feel alone. You're with your best friend. So that's why you know, I've always done, open the door of your heart to myself, you know, giving myself a hug, looking at myself in the mirror and smiling. And then you find you have this beautiful relationship with yourself. Yeah, you're not the most perfect one, but you're good enough. You're not the most perfect girl, the most perfect boy, but you're good enough. Good enough to love, respect, and be a good friend to. When you're a good friend to yourself, when you're with people, you're relaxed. When you're with yourself, you're also relaxed. Which means solitude, being in a big crowd, both the same. Because sometimes I look at myself, how many people in this world have spent six months alone? In solitude. And how many people have sat in front of audiences of 5,000 and 10,000, all in front of, all alone, and entertained them for a couple of hours. I do both. This is weird, isn't it? You know, am I an extrovert? When I'm in front of you, I tell jokes, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So, you know, it's a bit of an extrovert, but when you're alone, you're an introvert. You can do both with ease. And that's the nice thing to be able to do. Anyway. The last question, Venerable Sir. Actually, I should actually mention how to address me <laughs> appropriately, because some say Venerable Sir, some say Ajahn Brahm, sometimes, you know, Bhante. The correct, uh, the correct address for me at this stage of my monastic life is His Roundness, Ajahn <laughs> Brahm. They so say, your roundness, could you please answer this question? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that... <laughs> so I've got to stop laughing myself. 
Do you think that stillness is the ultimate key that switches the mind consciousness out of samsara and that the rest of the seven factors are just the essential conditions for stillness to be right? Yes, actually that's a very profound, that's what the Buddha said. Samadhi mago asamadhi kumago. The samadhi, the stillness, is the path. No stillness is not the path. Just before the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree, when he was really depressed because nothing was working, he remembered the time under, when it was a kid, <coughs> under the rose apple tree, he saw his father doing a sermon, he got bored stiff, so he decided to meditate instead, and got into jhana. And remembering that time, he said, is that the path to enlightenment, that jhana? And the realization said, yes, that's the path, that's deep stillness. Many times the Buddha said that. So yes, it is actually the essential part. The stillness is the path. And even you know that there is um, the decline of Buddhism. This is in the Kasapa Sangyuta, the five reasons for the decline of Buddhism. And the first one is disrespect to the Buddha, second disrespect to the Dhamma, disrespect to the Sangha, the third, fourth is disrespect to the training, and the fifth disrespect to Samadhi, to stillness. If you don't value the stillness, the Samadhi, basically the jhanas, Buddhism declines. Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, the training, and Samadhi. Kasapa Sangyuta. This means that the mango will not fall if the conditions are not right, no matter how still we sit. No, no, if, if you sit very still, those are the conditions the mango will fall. This also means that monkhood is the only good bet of getting the conditions right. So for us lay people, meditation is only to provide a little side effect of a calm mind. That's not true. Because sometimes, it's amazing, you guys can meditate so still, people in this room, lay people, have achieved jhanas. And you know sometimes, there was about a year ago, it was so unexpected, there was a guy who came on one of our retreats. He had tattoos all over him, you know, sort of, really like one of these um, Oka Australians. One of the people you would never think belonged in a Buddhist temple, but belonged in a pub. And, you know, just the whole look of him, you know, say, what are you doing here? But, you know, when he came for the interviews, he started describing what he'd experienced. And, I was amazed, I was stunned. You know, this guy was getting jhanas. And I don't know what his background was. But you know, and I've been around a long time. I know when you saw so you try and fake it. And you know, it's not a jhana, but this guy was the real thing. And the most unexpected. Which is why that sometimes you see people wearing white clothes or shaven hair. <laughs> and they look, oh, you know, these must be the real thing. And you get some guy who dresses in just totally inappropriate stuff. They've got tattoos and long hair and maybe piercings in their body. And you think, now what's this person doing here? And they go and meditate and they get it. You don't know, you can't tell. And lay people, they do get jhanas. So you're not wasting your time here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be teaching you. You know, a long time ago, I, I was one of the first monks who started teaching jhanas. And I got told off by some of the senior monks for doing that. And I still remember one of the senior monks in England. I was in England and I was visiting Amawati Monastery. And I was just going into the reception area. He was just coming out and he took me aside and he looked around and he said, Ajahn Brahm, thank you for teaching jhanas so that no one else would hear. It was almost like a controversial thing to do. But you know, I said, no, why? In the time of the Buddha, lay people got jhanas, so why not give them a try? And it worked. Not all of you, but some of you do. <laughs> and eventually, you know, you get there. If you don't even teach it, there's no way anyone gets jhanas. If you teach it, eventually these things happen. So it's brilliant, and so I'm very proud of you guys. That's why it's not a waste of time. Keep on going. 
So anyway, I still meditate. Next life I may be a monk. Who knows? Be prepared. <laughs> I'm not coming next life. I'm out of here. <laughs> enough is enough is enough. So, so you can. And that's one of the amazing things. It doesn't matter if you're a lay man or a lay woman, old or young. And it matters whether you put the causes in place. It's the brilliant teachings of the Buddha. As long as you've got the Eightfold Path, if you do the Eightfold Path, it doesn't matter even if you call yourself a Christian. If you've got the Eightfold Path, you'll eventually get to enlightenment. Of course you change your views on the path, on the way, but it's the causes give rise to the effects. If you let go, follow the instructions, eventually these jhanas appear. Just they're there because it's cause and effect. It's nothing to do with who you think you are. It's just cause and effect, that's all. You know, that's so inspiring for me. And it's just like me teaching the monks over the road. So as long as you keep carrying on practicing this path, you get results. It always happens. You just got to keep along, keep on the path, and then you get to the destination. That's how much faith I've got in this path. So keep on going. You may not get jhanas on this retreat, but maybe the next one or the one afterwards. You're always making progress, getting closer every time. So carry on. That's the last question, just getting into it. Okay. Wow, wow, it's really late, 9.30. I do apologise, but don't worry. Even though it's late, that means breakfast is not so far away. 